we are so glad to be here this morning uh, celebrating uh, this day, but it's also an exciting thing. We've determined um, uh, a month or so ago to go through the book of Philippians as kind of the closing passages of uh, the message that I feel that God has given us for the fellowship here, and I'm excited about that. But before we get into that, I do want to thank uh, uh, Josh Smith and uh, Jake Carnes and several others who were very busily uh, active over this last couple of days finishing up the front canopy out here, and amen. Literally, they were here, I believe, what, till 10 o'clock last night, Julie, finishing it up so it would be all uh, final and everything for, for that. So greatly appreciate all the hard work on that. But this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Amen. And all that God's doing for each one of us in this place. So if you join me in prayer, we'll... Uh, get into the study this morning. Again, Father, thank you that we can be here together, gathered on this Sunday morning, whether we're uh, online watching uh, wherever we might be, or Father, whether we're here in this auditorium, or whether we're in the overflow in the agape, Lord, wherever we might be, we know that your spirit works and moves through your word to touch our hearts and lives for your glory and for the glory of Christ. And Father, that's the very desire of our heart today, that in the teaching of your word, that man's not glorified, but Jesus Christ is honored and glorified here in this place. Father, we bless you, we thank you in Christ, and in his mighty name we pray, amen, amen. Well, as I've shared with you before, I believe that uh, the Apostle Paul had a, a, a pretty awesome connection with that church in Philippi. You can see it just in the, in the words uh, of, of the letter to the Philippians. And as we've gone through the first three chapters, today we are in chapter four, the last chapter of it. Uh, I, I see still within the writings of Paul this pastor's heart, a, a heart of care, a heart of concern for the people. The title that, that I chose for this last message as the senior pastor of Calvary Chapel of Casa Grande is Useless and Senseless. Now, is that a weird title or what? Some of you got worried real quick. Some of you tried to laugh. No, Useless and Senseless is the title of today. Now, if you hang with me, You'll get it as we get into it. Again, don't get me wrong. The title is not a description of what I feel over the last 29 plus years. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, I believe that uh, there's a lot of us that are within this room that could argue just the opposite, that the last 29 plus years have been a time really of true spiritual growth and, and, and purposeful ministry in a lot of lives that we've touched. Some that are here today, some that have been here and have moved on, some that are no longer are with us or with the Lord right now, some that are living in other parts of the nation, uh, some still in Casa Grande, they're just not here, but God has touched and moved on their lives, I believe, through the work of this ministry. And when I say this ministry, you need to understand, this is not David Landry ministry or Harvey David Landry ministry, okay? This is a ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's through his hand, through the work of the Spirit, that God has moved in this place. The greatest blessings I believe that we've had together is to be able to see God moving and working in the hearts and the lives of individuals and families, the people that God's brought through the years to be a part of Calvary Chapel of Casa Grande. So just hang in there with me, and I believe that you'll come to understand the title of the message pretty soon. I find it pretty interesting that as Paul kind of finishes up this short letter, that uh, almost the very last word that he gives, uh, he shares about a situation of some difficulty that was going on between two of the women within the fellowship. They're kind of having a hard time apparently with each other, some sort of a conflict, some sort of a, a struggle that, were, that they were having. Now, guys, don't get too prideful in this and that they were saying it was two women. No, guys have those problems too. Amen? Yeah, all the women ought to be saying amen for sure. But, uh, 
We actually shared uh, the first verse of chapter 4 last week in closing chapter 3 because I felt that it really tied in with what we heard during that section. But it does also fit into this next and coming session. So verse 1, it says, Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy, my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Again, that heart that, that Paul has for these people. So, uh, my beloved, uh, my joy and my crown. Paul knew that the impact of the ministry that God put through him to those people would count again for him eternally. That joy, that crown is what he speaks of. And I, can, I could use those very same words this morning in speaking of this fellowship. My beloved, my joy, and literally our crown, because uh, Todd has put as much, if not more, work in this ministry. I am re I'm listening to that proclamation from uh, Mayor McFarland. I said, her name ought to be on that, too, because uh, had she not been there, none of this would have uh, been it. I would have gone out and bought a motorcycle, guys, and hit the road long ago. So. <laughs> Paul tells the church to stand fast, and we spoke about that last week. Again, that need that all of us have to stand firm and stand fast against the craziness of the world that's going on around us right now today, as well as the continual attack of the enemy down through the ages. To stand fast and to stand firm, no longer swayed by all the things of this world. So now let's move on into chapter 4, uh, verse 2. Two. Here's where Paul says, I implore Judea and I implore Synthica to be of the same mind in the Lord. These are the two gals who are having the problems. I urge you also, true companion, someone that we don't know, he's writing to another person. Some people say, well, the Greek word for true companion could actually be a man's name, and maybe he's writing to a particular individual here. But anyway, verse 3, I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So you've got these two women, Eudea and Syntyche, or as uh, some have come to call them, instead of Eudea, call her useless, and instead of Syntyche, call her senseless. Useless and senseless. How sad it is that, that the, the, the most important thing remembered in their ministry is that they were contentious with each other as sisters in the Lord. This is all we know about them. Now all through the ages, useless and senseless fighting against each other and not in harmony laboring together in the Lord as they had been in the past. These two women had assisted Paul in the furtherance of the message of the gospel and now there's this something that's going on in their life that's separating their fellowship from each other. And more importantly, I believe also, it definitely is separating their fellowship with the Lord Jesus. When pride and arrogance come into play, you need to understand our Lord is gracious. When pride and arrogance come into our life, He just backs up and gets out of the way. If that's what you want in your life, you run with that. And as that, that great theologian, uh, Pastor Phil, says, how's that working out for you? Okay. The women were doing battle. Mental battle, spiritual battle, whatever kind of battle it was, I guarantee you there, there was a spiritual aspect about it all. And because of that battle, that's why they became useless and senseless in the work and in the cause of the gospel. Disputes and contentions, guys, they're always going to come. If you've been here for very many years, you know that in this ministry, through the years, there's been some disputes, there's been some battles, there's been some brothers and sisters that came here and were part of this ministry and for one reason or another felt that they needed to leave and, and go someplace else. And uh, what I learned long, long ago, and I, I'm going to pass this on to you, Bless them in their coming and bless them in their leaving. Because who knows 
but that the Lord might cause them to come full circle and come back. And you don't want to be the one that closes that door, okay? You want to be the one that's gracious and loving, even when there's a contention. So we, we look at this, um, when, when that dispute or when that contention comes, they will never bring about the plans and the purposes of God. What they do, actually, is they highlight the work of the enemy in our lives. And the sooner we recognize that, the sooner that we're going to be able to come to repentance and reconciliation with a brother or a sister. These women had served the Lord together in the furtherance of the gospel. Now their lives have become useless and senseless due to the conflict that was between them. And here Paul calls on some of the others within the fellowship there in Philippi to come alongside these women, to not, not in condemnation, but to come alongside of them in love and encouragement to help them to see the error of their ways. And once again, you see being worked out in a very practical way, Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one man or woman sharpens another. We come together for the furtherance of the gospel. We encourage each other. We strengthen each other. When conflict comes, others around us need to come and challenge us Again, to bring, come back to reconciliation. We need others within our lives to keep us sharp and to keep us on track. That's why someone who says, oh yes, I'm a Christian, but they never have fellowship at a church. Well, I just haven't found a church that I liked. Well, I'll be the first to tell you as the pastor of Calvary Chapel of Casa Grande, this ain't no perfect church, okay? We, we are not perfect. The day that that guy started that ministry back in 1991, imperfection came into it, okay? And from there, we just joined in a whole lot of unperfect people, and we are on the journey together, amen? As, again, chip-stained vessels, but we carry about that precious, precious gift within us, that priceless treasure of Christ within us. Do we need to speak the truth? Absolutely. And when there's conflict, we need to speak the truth. But as the word says, we speak the truth in love. And I believe that Paul is all in that, on that love portion. Look, guys, don't let these two gals continue that way. Surround them, encourage them, strengthen them. They were fellow workers together in the hope of the gospel. I believe that next, Paul, as we're moving on, I believe that next, Paul, gives us some instruction, uh, yes, on, on dealing with contention and bickering, not only between these two women, but also throughout the whole body of Christ. Look what, uh, what he says there in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Let your what, church? Your right answers? No. Let your attitude? No. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Paul believed that at any moment, at any day, the Lord Jesus Christ could come back for his church. And beloved, you and I need to see that because I believe that we are closer now than we have ever, ever been, not just because of the time factor, but look around you. Open your eyes and look around you. I think that I hear trumpets being war a trumpet being warmed up even right now. Uh, we, I believe that we are that close. So why would we take time out of what the Lord has for us here in this place, here and now, and be involved in bickering and in battling? Shouldn't we, again, in humility, come before that brother and sister and seek to be reconciled? Hey, listen. I know that you're right in your situation and in your stand. You wouldn't take that stand if you didn't believe that you were right. But even in your rightness, how about using a little bit of humility and working with the rightness that the other one is standing in, okay? Working together for the cause of the gospel. Again, as I shared last week, Philippians is the book of joy. Uh, and, and here the apostle, he, he's chained to a Roman guard, he's under house arrest, and he's calling the church itself to rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. And again, like I shared last week, this sounds like it ought to be words from the church coming to Paul. Paul, I know you're in, you know, under house arrest, I know you're in chains, but you just need to rejoice. 
No, he, he goes back to the church and the church and their relative freedom. And, and Paul in chains says, hey, you guys need to be rejoicing. You need to live with that heart, that attitude of rejoicing. Again, always. Guy Duffield in his book on theology writes, joy is love's reaction to God's mercies, blessings, and benefits. Christian joy is not, however, dependent upon circumstances. The joy which is a facet of love trusts God even in the midst of trying circumstances. Mere human joy looks at things upon earth and is affected by the condition of earth. Christian joy, which is a fruit of the Spirit, looks heavenward and remains steadfast despite the surrounding conditions because heaven's benefits are unvarying. And he writes, when the Spirit of God fills an individual, the joy of the Lord is bound to be there. For as the psalmist declares, for in thy presence is fullness of joy. Let's face it, guys, there's a lot to be distracted by in our present culture. All the junk that's going on, just absolutely amazing. Some of it, righteous indignation from, from acts that were wrongly done, but then others have taken from that and blown it up just to be anarchy and wickedness. And it's all over us. Great turmoil. Every, ever since sin entered into the equation through that disobedience of Adam and Eve in the garden, the wickedness of man has continued to rage and has continued to bring, again, destruction. So Paul, the guy in chains, the guy that's under house arrest, he continues his whole line of thought as he continues to encourage the church now in verse 6. He says, be anxious for nothing. If you write in your Bibles, I'm going to give you this one more time. If you write in your Bibles, and I encourage you to, circle that phrase. Be anxious for nothing. And if you don't want to write in your Bible, lean across and write in your neighbor's Bible. Okay? <laughs> but be anxious for how much, church? Nothing. Yeah, but what kind of a things are we supposed to be worrying about right now? Yeah, but what about things that, that we see on TV, we see on, on the internet? What are those things do we worry about? Nothing. Be anxious for how much? Nothing. Okay, does that make, am I, are we driving that in? Because I know we guys, we need repetition a lot in order for us to get it. Be anxious for nothing but in everything, everything by prayer and supplication. That's another one you need to write, circle around, draw arrows to, put stars next to, however you want to mar mark it. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to your best friend. That's a tricky answer. Because who ought to be our best friend? Amen. Let your request be made known to God. Who do I share my troubles, my trials, my frustrations with? Absolutely, my wife, my best earthly friend. But you know what? Most of those she can't do a thing about. Most of those she's kind of in the same quandary I'm in. But you know what? We bring everything to God. And then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. How do you keep from going nuts in the world that we live in? <clears throat> Be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That's when the peace of God comes. And that surpasses all understanding. We don't know how that works out, but it's the peace of God, the Spirit of God in our lives. He'll guard our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. Personally, I don't think that senseless and useless, I mean, Eudea and Synthica, I, I don't believe that they were praying about very much, and I definitely don't believe that they were praying for each other. They're probably praying again each other, amen? They were praying, oh, Lord, smite them, Lord. 
Okay, let's be honest. How many of you have prayed that prayer before? Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's a biblical prayer. I mean, David said it, so. Uh, <laughs> but the fact is, pray for your enemies, love your enemies. Do good to those who do evil against you. Jesus, yeah, it's funny, Jesus had the right idea, you know. We, again, put all those things before the Lord. Once you and I, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, determine to grow in our desire to focus on the Lord Jesus and our need to walk in the fullness of the joy that comes from him, that's, that's the only time then that God's peace is really and truly going to fill our hearts and will no longer, we ourselves will no longer be useless and senseless in our life choices or in the purposes of the kingdom. So how do we do that? Paul gives us the answer. And it's primarily you need to get rid of the stinking thinking. Okay, Get rid of your stinking thinking. And as he says here in verse 8, finally, brethren, Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. You want the peace of God in your life? Get rid of your stinking thinking and start thinking and meditating on those things that, again, will encourage and strengthen you, but even more than that, give glory and honor and praise to Christ. Don't let the things of the world drag you down to its level. We're so easily drawn there. No, we need to get rid of that and turn that around and keep again our eyes, our focus on Christ. All we need to do is watch the nightly news. You know, Check out the uh, national news updates, man. You get them dinging on your phone all the time. Oh, this is going on, this is going on. Uh, you, you start reading posts on Facebook or, or Twitter or Instagram, and suddenly we, we find out that the world is just absolutely insane and crazy, and why do those guys do that, and I'm so upset at that, and I think that I ought to do that, and man, it's a good thing for them that I'm not. And then pretty soon, man, we're down into the stinking thinking right with them. Amen? Or is it just me? I don't know. <laughs> Useless and senseless thinking and responses, vile and wicked actions and purposes. Guys, that's what's being spewed out by the world. And unfortunately, the church can get caught up in it very quickly. We as the church, we are representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ and we need to stop that sort of reaction and then turn and respond to the peace of God that passes all understanding. Not like the world gives, Jesus said, but that which comes from the very mind and heart of Christ himself. There's so much more that I could say about those couple of verses. We could spend a couple of weeks right here, but my U-Haul is packed, and we've got to move on. Okay. Paul then writes uh, of his personal gratitude toward the people of, Casagra or of uh, Philippi. Okay. <laughs> Verse 10. He says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. And he says, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Wow, another powerful, powerful section here as Paul is ending up the book of Philippians. Paul moved into the mission fields. He didn't get all that much support from the sending church. As a matter of fact, he depended upon 
upon the churches as he was going to support him. Much like Jesus sent out the disciples. Hey, don't take an extra purse with you. Don't take an extra bag. Don't take extra sandals. You go out and minister and the people will again meet your needs, those that receive you. And again, we find that over and over as you read uh, uh, Paul's letters to the churches, uh, churches that he either began or churches that were already existing that he came alongside of and assisted, you find there were sometimes some places where he worked with his own hands in that tent making trade. And when we began this ministry, gosh, it was probably a 10, 11, almost 12 years of me still working with the hands as the ministry was slow in growing, but yet God provided and God provided and the facility or the, 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 the ministry grew. It's amazing how when we fully trust in the Lord's provision, he'll more than meet all of our needs, just as, just as he's done for taught and me as well as for the whole ministry through the years. The church at Philippi had supported Paul both while he was there and now while he's under house arrest in Rome. He writes verse 14. He says, nevertheless, you've done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians, Know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. And not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. We spoke about Epaphroditus uh, last week. He is the guy that's probably carrying this letter from Paul in Rome to the church in Philippi. He was a man that was probably from Philippi. He had already demonstrated his love, his care for that fellowship. Now, the I remember way back at the very beginning, uh, Bertha and, and Robert were, were there with Tot and I, uh, just a, a home Bible study group. I think we'd been meeting for about four or five weeks, and Tot, you, you can get my dates right because I never get those right, uh, but it was about four or five weeks, and somebody came and gave us a check for the ministry. I didn't know what to do with it. We were just home Bibles. We didn't even have a name. We didn't have a bank account or anything. But the thing that touched my heart was that somebody wanted to support the work of the ministry. They saw God's hand enough in it. They wanted to make sure that the work of the ministry continued. And again, blown away by that. One of the things we took was that that was a clear sign from the Lord that where God guides God will provide. If he's calling us to this, he will take care of these other issues. We don't need to pound the people. We don't need to guilt the people. God, by the work of the Holy Spirit, works and moves in the lives of his people. Well, in the beginning, it was a very slow and uh, as, as a matter of fact, that book, uh, uh, all those pictures of where we met in those earlier years, we were church in a box. And uh, we just went from one location for six months, another one maybe for a year, and then another one for six months. And you wonder, why didn't the ministry grow? Because nobody could find us. You know, we were just, you know, just like they were, where, uh, they were here last week. Where did they go? It really wasn't until we came to, to this building, kind of uh, planted uh, our tent pegs a little bit deeper here. Uh, and, and the slowness of that growth, it used to frustrate me to no end until later on in ministry I realized, no, the reason it grew slow is because I was a slow learner and there was a whole lot that God had to do in my life before he trusted more than just a handful uh, on, under the pastoral care. Again, I, I stand amazed today as I look at literally the hundreds of people that call Calvary Chapel of Casa Grande home. That's one of the reasons why we love on Resurrection Sunday, uh, back when we had, were down at the property, we'd have everybody all together. We'd have the different congregations stand up. Because by and large, so many of you love that little old 100, 150 people 
people that go to Calvary Chapel of Castle Grande. It's a nice, sweet little fellowship. And you don't realize that the ministry actually, including the Spanish ministry right now, is, is around 500 people. You know, uh, we, we had our Saturday night, our two Sunday mornings, and now the Spanish ministry. And, and again, God has blessed in such an amazing way. He's been faithful through it all. It, did, it, it, it didn't really have the finances to acquire this building and property when we needed it, but God. We didn't have the finances for me to come on full-time to put my, my construction tools down and, and actually become a full-time pastor. We didn't have the finances to do that, but God. We didn't have the money to put on other staff, but God. And all through the 29 plus years, we've seen God move first in the hearts of the leadership to act upon his leading and to have faith to take ventures of faith. And then God moved on the hearts of the people in their faithful support of the work of the ministry. It was as in the Old Testament when Joshua told, the, or the Lord told through Joshua that the priests needed to come and put their feet in the river Jordan. And as soon as, and it wasn't parting until then. The way wasn't made available until the leadership took that step of faith. And we've seen that over and over and over again. Miracle and miracle by God's hand in support of the work. Through the years, again, Todd and I, as well as uh, the ministry of, a, a, as a whole, we've seen the fulfillment of, of Paul's words here in verse 19. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. It wasn't everything we always wanted, but it was always more than we ever needed. And so with Paul, I believe that we can boldly say he supplied all of our needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes into verse 20. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And you think with that, amen, okay, that's it. No, he keeps going. Uh, and, and so will I. Uh, in, in many of Paul's epistles, near the end of them, he lists, uh, he gives a list of uh, individuals within that ministry that have been a blessing, uh, names of those that he sends greetings to or those who are with him. Uh, he, he doesn't really do that so much here uh, uh, in, in, in the book of Philippians. He does it a little bit different. Verse 21, he says, just greet every saint in Christ Jesus and uh, the brethren, all of them that are with me, they send greeting to you. We get, uh, you know, at the beginning, Paul and Timothy, there, and then a little bit later we get uh, Epaphroditus and Clement and uh, Useless and Sin or Eudea and Synthica. Uh, we get those few names, but at the end he kind of clumps everybody together. But look what he says in, in verse 22. All the saints greet you, especially those who are of Caesar's household. If I were to take the time this morning to mention all the names of the saints that have gone through this ministry, that have impacted this ministry in a positive way, uh, we'd be here all afternoon. And the unfortunate reality is, is I'd probably miss about half of them because of where my brain is right now. But uh, not all of them and not all of you came through these doors as saints. Some of you are even here today when uh, I made it pretty good thus far, though. Mm. Yeah. Some of you came here or, uh, when you first came to Calvary Chapel. You didn't know the Lord Jesus. You came to a saving knowledge of Christ through this ministry and the witness of countless individuals that have been a part of this ministry. Some of you came to this ministry, you were already a believer in Christ, and here you were ignited in, in your passion for the Lord and for His Word and for service to the Lord. Or maybe you came here and you already had a growing and a thriving relationship with Christ, and here at Calvary Chapel of Casa Grande, you found family. Once again, it's the work of the Holy Spirit moving in and through willing and hungry 
hearts. Calvary Chapel of Casa Grande has simply been a conduit, again, of the faithful teaching of the word and hopefully a place of peaceful refuge. One last thing I want to bring out here. Paul does speak about those that are of Caesar's household. And I think that from here we can pretty well correctly surmise that while Paul was under house arrest, not only soldiers hearing the testimony of Christ, but apparently some of Caesar's household, either family or servants, we don't really know the way that it's framed. But anyway, they too had come to a saving knowledge of Christ because Paul was in chains. So stop and think about that for a moment. And I want to make sure that you get this out of this message also. Outside of Paul's arrest and being in Rome, where would they have heard or received the hope of the gospel? One more reason for you and I to be content wherever the Lord has us is that he may be working out through the difficulties that we're facing. He may be working out his plan and purpose through your life as a conduit of his grace, his mercy, and truth to other people that you can't even begin to imagine. So when the trials come, be content in the Lord. Lord, I trust you. I don't like the situation. I don't think there's a day that Paul would have said, this is really cool being chained to a stinking Roman soldier 24-7. I don't think there's a day in his life he's, he, he thought that that was great. But I believe that he could thank God for it because he knew that God had not only allowed it, but God was working through it to bring others to Christ. In your life, in my life, in all the situations that God brings us through, we need to remember our God has a purpose and a plan. I'm going to ask Rachel and Jake and the team to come on up. Guys, our, our, our job isn't to figure out why you are where you are. Why you're going through what you're going through. Your job, my job, our job together is to, to simply be found faithful to the Lord's leading in our lives. And when we are found to be faithful, available, and usable, then the Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified through our lives and sometimes in some very surprising ways. If on the other hand, though, we're found to be useless and senseless, we'll never experience all that God has prepared for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. I pray that that truth, that hope, that reality sticks with you. Our lives live for the glory of Christ, content in Him, rejoicing in Him, thankfulness in Him will help you and I through every struggle, through every trial. And believe me, as I've heard the stories, as I've met with many of you, I know that many of you are going through a lot of trials, a lot of struggles. Some that are listening online, you're, the reason you're online is because you're going through a lot of trials and struggles. Our hope, our faith is found in Christ and in Christ alone. Paul ends this with kind of a real quick blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with, well, if he was in Texas, how would it be? All y'all. <laughs> and then he says, amen. Well, the worship team has a song that they would like to close with. And at that, uh, I'll close. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for the reality and the truth of your word. May it continue to touch our hearts and lives for the glory and the honor of Christ. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching and listening to the current series. We're glad that the Lord is blessing you with this teaching. As you continue on in the teaching of the word of God in your life, we pray that the Holy Spirit might take that word, plant it deep within your heart and life, that you might see the fruit of God's love, 
the reality of his presence and the power of his spirit working in your life.